Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 100. I'm your host, Eric Moore, and this week we're asking the question, what causes inflation? Do we know? What are the types of things that might cause it? And by the way, are we doing a good job of measuring inflation? You know, we hear a lot of talk about how inflation might be higher than, you know, the official metrics. Why is that? And how is inflation different across different areas in the marketplace? And so, you know, list year, this week, last couple of weeks, we've seen an uptick in the rate on the U.S. Treasury note, which is a good barometer. You know, it's it's got a, a good correlation with, uh, with inflation. It's not exactly inflation, but certainly when rates rise, uh, that may be indicative of inflation expectations rising as well. But the 10-year Treasury yield went above 1%. The five-year Treasury went above half a percent. Now, by the way, in historical context, those are really low numbers. I mean, rates are extremely, you know, record-breaking low in the U.S. on U.S. Treasury basis. And across the world, many countries' sovereign bonds and sovereign rates are actually negative yielding to maturity. And there's a lot of reasons why that is. One, you know, Of course, you know, the Eurozone, the European Central Bank, they are actually buying a lot of sovereign bonds. Sovereign bonds just refers to, you know, bonds that are issued by countries. And I think it's 30 or 40% of all the paper, all the bonds are held by the, uh, the ECB, European Central Bank. And when it comes to the U.S., uh, certainly the Federal Reserve has been increasing their balance sheet and buying treasuries is certainly, you know, one of the, the functions there. But we talk about the different types of inflation. There's really, you know, people refer to it as there's like two core ones, and then there's there's sort of these other ones, and and it ranges everything from you know hyperinflation to you know endemic inflation or structural inflation, and then you have cost push and demand pull. Those are all fancy ways that. You know, economists refer to the different types of inflation. So when we think about cost push, uh, typically that means there's a, a push in the cost to produce goods. And really what they're saying is the input cost of products, services, you know, whatever it is, the materials, those are going up. And so you know, it just goes to reason. We know that there's net profit margins, you know, that a company has to buy something, buy materials, produce it. It costs them a certain amount of money to, to buy that. And then when they want to sell it, they want to sell it for a profit. So if we see that the input costs go up, meaning a company's cost to produce a certain good or deliver a service goes up, it would be natural to say uh, they would probably raise prices. And so cost push inflation deals with that. You know, a good example of this is, um, what's, what's a good example? You know, maybe we, we think about home builders. So home builders, what are they doing? They're, they're building houses. And they build new homes, and they hopefully want to sell those at a profit. And what do you think are some of the, the input costs? Well, I mean, one of the major ones is lumber. So lumber, meaning the wood that they need to build the houses, that's that's a pretty big, um, you know, part of the the house. I guess you could say, you know, I don't know if they use copper all the time for pipes, but copper, copper piping as copper prices increase, yeah, you might see those costs. Uh, it's actually interesting. Someone was telling me one of the things. Uh, someone I don't know how many years ago was telling me they were uh, there's somebody who built houses, and they said uh, this is a long time ago. They used to. Uh, always worry or they always had to have security because people would come in before the houses were finished and they'd actually steal the, the copper pipes and go sell them when, because uh, that was one of the things. But anyway, so lumber, let's use lum lumber. So lumber cost increase, that's wood, um, that's going to increase the cost to, to build a house. And then naturally, as that house is being sold, in order to still maintain profit margins, You've got to raise the the cost of something. Um, we also see this 
maybe it's a, a different topic, but uh, some of the arguments with minimum wage, uh, there are certain restaurants where if you're required to, you know, a lot of people work as waiters, waitresses, um, you know, they, they work on tips and there's sort of a, you know, a minimum per hour. It's very low uh, typically that they, they have to make, but, you know, they make most of their money on tips. And one of the ideas was if you raise the federal minimum wage or state minimum wage, you know, $15, $20 an hour, uh, that's going to make having those folks very prohibitive for a restaurant. So they would need to increase their food cost. So think, think cost push inflation is an increase in the cost to produce goods. Uh, and input costs as they rise, um, that certainly will have an effect on prices. The other one, one of the core ones, is on the demand side. And people call this the d- demand pull inflation. And really, it's the old, quote unquote, too, too much money chasing too few goods. So you've got excessive demand in markets. And really, there's, there's more demand than somebody can produce. So demand is higher than supply. It's sort of a, a core component of, of economics, right? Uh, when demand's higher than supply, uh, prices move up uh, because people, you know, have to, uh, they want to buy those goods. You know, a really good example of this was during the early stages of the COVID, uh, I don't know, crisis or whatever we want to call it, right? But um, you had a lot of the different governments, different parts of the, the world, different states were locking down economies. But it was, it was kind of interesting, you know, most, I shouldn't say most people, there's probably a blend between those who work at home and have dumbbells, exercise equipment, and those that go to gyms. When you close down all the gyms, there was a, a literal run on, um, you know, like home exercise equipment. And I remember going onto Amazon and seeing, you know, what should have cost twenty dollars, people are trying to sell for a hundred, two hundred dollars, and. That's a good example of you know the sudden increase of demand or just a demand that's greater than supply, but certainly they couldn't produce uh, to meet that demand, so prices went up. But demand, when demand goes, you could have demand uh, causing inflation. You could also have input cost uh, causing inflation. And demand is very you know that's a lot easier to think about. The input costs are sometimes less easy, although hopefully I've explained it as such. But it's natural. I mean, you, you might not, demand might be the same, but if the cost to, to produce a good goes up, prices will go up there. And then the other one, I'll, I'll touch on hyperinflation last, but yeah, some people call it endemic in, inflation or systemic inflation or just um, really it, it's structural inflation. I think that's the, the term a lot of people use. And it's just this idea that once people get used to inflation, it sort of builds upon itself and people's expectations change. Expectations are that you believe prices will rise in the future and you believe that, you know, there's some impetus to, uh, to buy now versus waiting. Uh, so you actually expect price increases. And in a lot of cases, people become numb to it. It's just the new normal. So, if you have structural inflation, basically, you know, the, everyone just sort of expects things to, to go up. Uh, you're okay paying higher prices maybe. Or you pull forward future demand to the current. And so here's kind of a um, – let's use maybe cars, right? Or actually houses. So recently there's been some talk about, um, you know, people trying to buy houses – they might be told by you know someone they know, maybe it's a realtor, maybe it's, it's a hey, look, um, prices are only going to go up from here, and so you have to buy now. So it's this idea that hey, if I wait, I'm going to have to pay more price. By the way, who knows what what real estate prices are going to going to go? Uh, but certainly, I remember back in 2006, 2007, that was one of the thoughts too, that you've got to you've got to buy now because if you if you wait. And the opposite of that during, you know, really deflationary periods, I mean, if you think about it, the last time you, you bought a, a car, 
uh, you might, well, I mean, recently car prices of um, supply has been a little bit lower, but, you know, generally you're kind of like, oh, I could buy this car, but if I just wait, the dealer will be looking to get it off the lot or, you know, certainly TVs are one of those things too. If you see a TV that you want, you know, eventually, <laughs> at least the way things have been going, TVs have seen one of the, the, the best for consumers drops in price over the years. Um, they haven't seen the inflation necessarily, but, um, you know, if, you, if there's a TV you like, you just say, well, I could buy it now or I could, you know, historically, uh, you know, they've gone down in price. The quality has gone up. So if I just wait a little bit, you know, there's no impetus to really to, to buy there. So that structural inflation really deals with when expectations change. Uh, it builds on itself. So inflation begets more inflation. And then, you know, the, the final one that caught, you know, the cause for inflation really deals with hyperinflation. When you deal with hyperinflation, typically it's something to do with a currency. So there's two really famous ones. Uh, Weimar Germany had hyperinflation. Um, there was a book written on, I think it was called, uh, what was that called? When Money Dies, I think was the name of the book. I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes. But that was all about the, the post-war uh, Weimar Republic in Germany. And I think in the book, it's been a long time since I looked at the book, but I think there's a story of people, it was cheaper to use the currency, like the the notes, the dollar, their equivalent dollar bills, right? The bills to, to wallpaper versus buying wallpaper. And Zimbabwe was the other one. Zimbabwe was that late 90s, early 2000s, where, uh, you know, there was pictures of kids going to buy bread and they were holding, you know, like a wheel, literal wheelbarrow full of currency. You know, their arms were sort of stretched out and they holding all this currency. In fact, Zimbabwe, uh, I think it's a collector's item now, but they actually issued, you know, think about a dollar bill or a $5 bill. They actually issued one tr $100 trillion notes. So it was like, you know, 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars uh, would equal like one U.S. dollar, something like that. But hyperinflation is, you know, a lot to do with people losing faith in a currency. You don't want to hold it. Like the longer you hold it, the the, the more value it 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 goes down. Right? Um, it's it's a vicious cycle. And uh, the U.S. dollar is, you know beyond the scope of, the, of this podcast, uh, being a reserve currency, and there's some other nuances here. Um, it, it, but one of the things that you, you might see is if there's a country that they may not borrow in their own currency. So you see this with some of the emerging markets where you know they want to issue bonds, but people may not necessarily want to hold uh, the bonds in that currency because they worry about inflation or, or loss of uh, of value. And so they issue these bonds in, uh, in let's say, US dollars or in euros or, or something else. And so sometimes, you know, countries, they might print more currency, devalue their currency, and in order to, to pay, pay off the debt, right? So it's um, hyperinflation, you know, typically is, is you know, deals with the currency and it's just think about it you know you just don't believe in the currency anymore there's there's uh, uh it's losing value so you know those are really the uh, the four sort of i mean it's really two core but then you know extended out to those hyperinflation cost push demand pull and we'll call it structural inflation now not all inflation is is equal and i i if i can find it i'll I'll link to it. I, I don't remember where I saw it, but generally, you know, if you go back over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years, some things continue to go up and some things actually go down in price, sort of. And how this is measured, um, there's something called the, the CPI or the Consumer Price Index. And there's some debate about whether that's the right metric. Does it actually capture inflation? And the CPI in its original form was a fixed basket of goods. Think, you know, you go to the supermarket and you put certain things in the basket. And as, um, you know, it, it would follow, 
the cost of those goods over time and it built an index. And so if your basket went up in price, the CPI would move higher and the, the rate of change, the percent change would, would be sort of a good measure of uh, the change in inflation. Well, the, the major thing that they did with that um, is they allowed for more substitutions. And so instead of fixing that basket of a certain quantity, a certain number of things, what they would do is they would say, okay, so um, what, what's, uh, I saw one of the examples given, like, okay, so like Swiss cheese goes, there's a run on Swiss cheese, demand is really high, or there's cost plus inflation. I don't know. Anyway, it, it's Swiss cheese goes through the roof. You know, people might switch to Munster cheese or Monterey Jack cheese or something like that. So it's this idea that if price gets gets too high, there's a substitution. If there is a substitution, right? And then the other main thing uh, that happened is they started to to look at the quality of of goods, and they call that hedonic adjustments or hedonic uh, quality adjustments. And so, what does that mean? That's it's a kind of a complicated formula beyond, you know, which is talking to you over the, uh, on the microphone here, I would, I would do it a disservice trying to, to go through the, the nuts and bolts of it, but let's just give a good example. Let's say your, your iPhone was a thousand dollars last year, you know, whatever, this is the top model there. And, you know, okay, you're like a thousand dollars for an iPhone. And then the following year, the iPhone is $1,100. And you would say, well, that's clear. On that component of the basket, uh, your cost went up 10%, but not so fast because that new iPhone is a lot faster, has different features, the camera's better. So they make sort of these quality adjustments. And so maybe after they do the quality adjustment, the the effect on inflation as measured, you know, the way they measure it is actually much less than 10%. Uh, so look at it this way. Let's say that they measure the, the improvements outweigh the, the price. So maybe instead of 10%, you actually, from an inflation standpoint, after adjusting for quality, it only causes a 3% increase for the cost of the cell phone. Um, I, I guess you could... If the adjustments were so far, um, you could actually say it went down in price after adjusting for, um, you know, quality adjustments, right? So that's one of the reasons why people look at that and they say, well, if you're, and, and sure, you don't have to buy the iPhone. You could buy a phone that is much cheaper. You know, there are substitutes and things like that, but uh, certainly like TVs, Everyone remembers the, the quality of TVs in, in the 70s and 80s was nowhere near what they are today. You got 4K TVs and, uh, you know, the sound quality, the picture, they're much bigger, thinner, all those types of things. So they're certainly better. But that's that's one of the um, just complexities of of how you measure inflation. And so, you know, not everything goes up, not everything goes down. But certainly things like college tuition, tuition, health care, um, hospital care, uh, delivery, you know, like shipping. I think some of the shipping uh, or delivery costs is encouraged. Gas, price of gasoline, especially when you, you put all those taxes in. Although I don't know, I'm trying to know if, if they actually account for, if, that's, if the taxes are included in that. I haven't looked at that in a while. Um, rent has gone up. So th things like that, they all have gone up over time. You know what hasn't gone up? TVs. Uh, you know, TVs, uh, I think I saw, you know, there's actually been a, a drop in the price of TVs, especially when you look at the quality. So TVs have certainly gone down. And that's, that's why I use that as an example of expectations. So, you know, when you look at TV, you're like, oh, TVs are only going to go up. No, they're not actually. Uh, chances are what was the top of the line last year is not the top of the line anymore, and you're going to be able to get it cheaper. Uh, but toys, clothes, all those things certainly went down. And one of the arguments for for the reason why some things goes up, some things go down, is certainly input cost, uh, but productivity. Productivity is, 
you know, the, uh, the classic thing is the output per, um, how, you, how, how should I put this really? Um, you look at, you know, let's say you make 12 pizzas. Yeah, let me give you a really easy one. Let's say you own a store and there's 12 pizzas and you got a guy working at the store. Um, and the productivity is 12 pizzas per one hour worked. Okay. And so if your productivity went up, well, now you can do 20 pizzas for one hour worked or your productivity can stay constant. I mean, it's still the 12 pizzas you can go down. Okay. But, um, it, it deals with, it's the cost to produce goods. It's, it deals with the output per unit of input, uh, labor, output per hours worked, all of these types of things. And so when you think about um, you know, some of the, the technological advances in manufacturing or uh, maybe companies that made clothes, they used to make them in the UK or in the US and they moved to uh, more emerging markets where labor costs are down, that has, has a, a definite impact. Now, when you look at things like uh, tuition and you look at uh, you know hospitals and things like that, you've got other things in the mix there. You've got regulation. You've got uh, a lot of regulation. I mean, think about how regulated um, healthcare is. Um, by the way, maybe after the, the whole coronavirus thing, uh, there'll be a paradigm shift in in higher education with you know cost to deliver and more online things but uh, but certainly productivity plays plays a role there for sure so you know that's uh, that's generally what causes inflation um, technological advances can can change things uh, labor inputs can change things cost of goods can change things um, but all those things so if you want to follow what inflation is, um, there's a couple different ways. You can look at the, CP, the consumer price index, and it's really that percent change month over month, year over year, those types of things. You can look at productivity numbers. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether that's actually still being captured correctly. And by the way, CPI really matters because guess what? Those getting Social Security, uh, the increase in the benefits, uh, use what's called a COLA, cost of living adjustment, to decide how much more the the benefits going to be the following year. Uh, the other thing that uh, that some people follow is called the break even rate, and break even rates look at the spread uh, between, let's say the the U.S. Treasury, let's say that you know ten year U.S. Treasury, and a ten year TIPS bond, uh, Treasury infl- Treasury Inflation Protected Security. And so the break-even rates, which are currently just over 2%, are sort of what the, the market expectations are for future inflation. So that, that's something to watch. You can look at CPI, you can look at inflation, you can look at the break-even rates, um, you know, and all those things. But, um, and you can also look at, um, you know, obviously GDP, you can look at, uh, you know, any number of the metrics. But Really, there's going to be a lot of talk about inflation. Part of the talk of inflation is that a lot of stimulus, uh, people getting checks in the U.S., uh, maybe other parts of the world, uh, money supply being increased. Maybe we'll do another episode on all of that because that's quite involved. Um, And sometimes uh, that causes inflation. Sometimes it causes inflation where, you know, you actually uh, have – a lot more money, chasing too few goods. That's one of the, the theories. The other is that increasing the money supply doesn't necessarily mean inflation because uh, that might go to asset inflation. It might, you know, uh, deal uh, you know, more more go on the bank balance sheets. But when you're dealing with uh, discussions around, you know, hey, should we send out direct payments to people? Should we have a guaranteed basic income? You know, these are all things that uh, if if you could give everyone a million dollars tomorrow, uh, but would prices stay the same? Wouldn't prices just go up and your purchasing power would go down? So th- these are all interesting things to consider. We may do, uh, do an episode in the future on those. Uh, but certainly interest rates and inflation are linked. And so last couple of weeks when you saw rates go up, and again, 1% on a 10-year is not a lot, but given it was, you know, uh, around 60, you know, 60 basis points, 70 basis points for a while, 
Uh, and certainly the, the five-year went from, you know, quarter percent to half a percent. That's a hundred percent change in rates, although they're still really low. Uh, but, you know, certainly the, the theory is if you've got inflation, the Fed would have to raise interest rates. But one of the things we still haven't seen is the velocity of money change. And I did an episode on, you know, inflation, velocity of money. Uh, velocity of money, for those that, you know, you can, you can uh, I'll put a link to it. Uh, it's worth a listen. But, you know, if you... Velocity of money is just how many times that same $1 bill changes hands. You buy a slice of pizza for a dollar. Uh, pizza shop owner goes, buys a new p- newspaper for a dollar. That person goes and buys, uh, you know, uh, orange for a dollar, wine orange. I don't know. I just thought. Anyway, but or if there's no velocity in the money, the theory is it wouldn't cause inflation. So I'll put a link to, to that in the show notes. I'll also put a link to... Uh, where you can find on the St. Louis Reserve uh, website, which is Fred, F-R-E-D. If, and any of this stuff, you just Google Fred Inflation or Fred CPI. Uh, incredible wealth of free stuff, information from the uh, Reserve Bank of St. Louis, which is one of the member banks of the Federal Reserve that they put out there. So um, please share this with someone that you think might be interested in it. Um, certainly you can give us a, a good review. And keep the questions coming. A lot of these episodes are derived from listener questions or suggestions for topics. So we'll be back next week with another episode. And we'll talk to you then. 